Um, so, so as you described, Sen's main focus is actually is developing early stage. Now, would, would you say that Sen's is only focused on regenerative? Um, do you have do you look at any of kind of delaying so like rapamycin or metformin delay the onset? Do you look at those or only regenerative? Yeah, no, we don't. We don't. We are focused only on damage repair. And a lot of the reason is not because we think that delaying and slowing down the creation of damage is pointless. Not at all. It's just that other people are doing that quite well. Um, now, we do think that the measures that people are looking at, whether it's metformin or rapamycin or resveratrol and so on, these things have a limit to how much they will be able to achieve. Mm. because they will only work to the extent that they can trick the body into looking after itself better. So uh, nearly a century ago, but it was determined that if you feed a mouse or a rat maybe 30 or 40% less than it would like, it lives maybe 30 or 40% longer, which is huge, right? If we could do that for humans, that would be rather nice. And of course, humans have this problem that they rather enjoy eating. So um, it's not necessarily possible to get them to do that mm -hmm. uh, but in principle one should be able to develop drugs that trick the body into thinking it's in a famine when it isn't and you get the best of both worlds the problem unfortunately is and this has been demonstrated very clearly and consistent with evolutionary theory as well that long-lived species like humans gain far less from calorie restriction not nothing but far less than short-lived species like mice or rats so uh, you know, there's only so far we can go. That certainly doesn't mean that this is not worth doing. The big reason why it is worth doing is that it's much easier to do than damage repair. The technologies are much simpler. You've just got individual drugs that have these very multifaceted um, effects. And uh, rapamycin and its analogs are probably the most effective that we've got at the moment within that, but we might get even better ones. But what we do know is that we're never going to develop drugs that go beyond what calorie restriction itself can do, because we're activating the same pathways, you see, and they've been optimized for actual famine. Um, so yes, yeah, so um, it's better than nothing, but it's not much better than nothing. And we are very happy that such drugs are being developed and indeed are in clinical trials and going to be approved and so on, because they will allow some people to effectively make the cut to actually live long enough in a healthy enough state still be around um, when the real thing, the real rejuvenation therapies that people like Sense Research Foundation are working on actually arise when they wouldn't have been around that long otherwise. Right. Yes, no, that, I mean, that makes sense. And that's kind of like what I'm doing. Um, so you, one other thing you mentioned on Joe Rogan, I believe, was that you would need to address the kind of the hallmarks piecemeal, right? So you need to address all of them. Um, so a couple of things from that. So one is, do you, do you see that all of them need to be addressed before you're going to see a big change, right? Um, so you've got seven of them, you've got to address all of them. And even if you address six of them, if you miss one, then, you know, you're still not going to make a big change in, in the average or, or even the extent. Right. So there's two things to say about that. Um, first thing is, yes. Um, the, the, all of these things, any of these types of damage can kill you on its own, more or less on schedule, however well we fix all the others. So that's true. But there is some crosstalk between the things. In other words, if you fix one type of damage, then it kind of makes it slightly more possible for the body to minimize the rate at which the other types of damage are accumulating. It's kind of like a, a little bit less stress. Mm -hmm. So you do get some crosstalk. And the magnitude of that cross talk may be a bit bigger than I actually would have anticipated 10 years ago. Um, when we, in particular, when we started to be able to remove senescent cells from mice, um, we found that the um, beneficial effects were very widespread and quite, quite substantial. So, um, you know, there was more, the, the, there's more cross talk than I was expecting, and that's obviously good news. Um, However, um, yes, certainly we, we still do have uh, the problem of that this is a divide and conquer approach. Right. So, and, and I, so I guess my second, but the second part of my question is kind of, you, you were kind of addressing it. So do you see that there would, there could be a systematic way? I mean, it's like the, the body knows how to be young. You, you can clone a cell, right? And, and 
and you can recreate a completely new thing, a new, a new version of you. So the body knows what it is to be young. Um, do you see, like, I, I saw so, um, parabiosis, right? Mixing the blood. And that seemed to have a, on rats anyway, a, a fairly good systematic effect. I mean, do you see that that is a possibility that there, there would be some reset that would have a wider effect? Okay, so you, I'm going to have to answer that question in two very separate parts because parabiosis doesn't really have much to do with the other part of what you said. Okay. Um, so let me do the parabiosis part first. So this is uh, parabiosis is an experiment that we would not do clinically because it involves surgically um, attaching two animals to each other so as to merge their um, circulatory systems. If you do this with a young rat and an old rat, then the old rat does indeed get younger in many ways. And yeah. this is great. Um, so um, what this basically says is that some of the mechanism for this crosstalk between different types of damage and between damage in different tissues is mediated physically by actual material that is moving between different organs in the bloodstream. And in other words, the bloodstream gets progressively more contaminated by bad stuff and maybe more depleted of good stuff um, as the animal gets older, so that if you infuse a bunch of good stuff from the young animal, then of course that is, that kind of um, interrupts this crosstalk and uh, prevents old, you know, damaged organs from accelerating the accumulation of damage in, each, in, in other organs of the old animal. Um, and of course we don't need necessarily to do it surgically, so what is clinically relevant is the possibility of, in, of taking plasma out of young people mm -hmm. and injecting it into old people. And that is the basis for a number of companies that have sprung up over the past few years, including one called Alcahef, which actually was the first example of a really high value acquisition within the emerging rejuvenation industry. It was bought by a Spanish um, uh, dialysis company for a few hundred billion dollars uh, just a few months ago. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's parabiosis, and it's all very interesting, but it's not a reset of anything. It's just, you know, uh, a, a kind of circuit breaker of the trans of the transfer of damage between organs. What is a reset is what you said earlier about the um, taking a cell back to an back to an embryonic state. Mm. And of course, this is a big deal right now in medicine because it was discovered back in two thousand six that you could do this. You could take cells and uh, expose them to just four different proteins, and they would kind of um, revert to being like an embryo, like embryo cells, um, which don't exist in the body normally. And this was believed to be very valuable. It is very valuable because you can use these cells to create other types of adult stem cells that can be used therapeutically. And because you can do this starting from cells that come from the person that you're eventually going to inject the stem cells back into, you can avoid the immune rejection problem that normally exists when you inject somebody else's stem cells into somebody. Yeah. Um, so that's all wonderful. But we have to be very careful when we think about this as a therapeutic regimen in a more direct way. So there is a lot of interest right now in the idea of kind of doing a little nudge in the general direction of this embryo, uh, becoming an embryo again, mm -hmm. um, to, the body, it, to the body itself, which is called partial in vivo reprogramming. The idea is you kind of have a small pulse of these proteins and maybe that will make cells that are not quite as stem-like as they ought to be, a little bit more stem-like and a little bit more regenerative and that will be good for the body. And indeed there have been a bunch of experiments in the laboratory in mice showing that this seems to work. So that's all wonderful up to a point. The problem is that first of all, you mustn't take it too far because if you do, you'll end up with cells that are too versatile, too embryonic, and mm -hmm. they won't know what to do. They will, therefore, they will do the wrong thing in the wrong place. Uh, often you will get a type of cancer called a teratoma forming. And indeed, the first time that this was tried, it was, you know, people knew that that was going to happen and they just wanted to see whether you could do it at all. And sure enough, they got lots of teratomas. So that, that was a proof, proof of principle, but it has no therapeutic value. It was only after that that people started nudging it and trying to do it just at the right level so that they could get benefit. But even that is really dangerous because the human body, the adult human body, especially the middle-aged adult human body, is full of cells of not only very different types in terms of what they're supposed to be doing, but also in terms of 
um, how damaged they are. And some of those cells, a lot of those cells are precancerous. They are just, you know, one or two mutations away from becoming really bad for you. Uh, so we don't want that, right? Um, and if that happens, then um, if, if we get cells that are um, almost cancerous and we tip them into being cancerous, we won't actually find that out for quite a long time because the cancer has to grow enough to actually, um, you know, to be clinically detectable. But it's still bad. We don't, still definitely don't want to do it. So, um, we've got to be, so I'm, I'm not all that convinced that partial reprogramming is going to work. There is one way out of what I've just said, which is to use different types of stimuli, in, in particular to express different genes that uh, may allow cells to go some way back into, um, their, into an earlier and more stem-like state, but not so far as to become cancerous. But that's still very early stage research. We don't really know whether that's true. Right. Yes. Interesting. I mean, so I, I mean, on that side, I mean, we did talk to Dr. Sebastiano um, from Turn Bio. Yeah. yeah. So he's trying something along those lines, which is, which seems hopeful anyway. Um, well, right. Yes. I mean, so Turn has an approach which involves injecting not the genes for these proteins, but the intermediate thing, this thing called the messenger RNA. Um, which is a neat way of titrating the amount of protein that is expressed and how long it's expressed for. But I'm still not sure that they're going to be able to do it safely enough. I think they may, get, they may through a couple more iterations of, make, of targeting the, um, the, the therapy to different tissues and you know, ensuring that cancers do not develop. Right, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so of the ones that you're, I, I guess the ones that... Uh, SENS is looking at now, what do you see as the most exciting new technologies that you're working on? Right, so of course that's a really hard question to answer for somebody who's at the coalface and looking at all the science all the, every day, because for me, um, you know, there are exciting things happening all the time in all of the areas that we're working on, but um, in order to explain why these things are exciting, I would have to spend half an hour giving background, right? Uh, because it's all really, really technical. Um, but all I can say is, I mean, let me, talking at the top level, I can certainly say that things are moving a lot faster. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, and as you were asking, this is a divide and conquer approach, and we've got to get all of these things working. And the same seven things that I talked about today were the things I was talking about 20 years ago. So that's good news. We haven't discovered any new problems. But until I'm going to say six years ago, um, it wasn't looking too good in terms of progress. There were two of the seven things that were progress that we'd made that by that time was pretty negligible. And it wasn't clear how we were gonna fix that. And then more or less at the same time, about in the, in the, in the, in a, over a period of a year or two, both of those areas, which is mitochondrial mutations and the cross-linking you asked about earlier, mm -hmm. they saw really nice breakthroughs and they're now rolling pretty well, both of them. So now there is no real show-stopping type of damage for which we are seeing only particularly slow progress. Everything's moving fast. Right. Okay. Well, that sounds really encouraging. Well, I was trying to understand how the, the mitochondria, like backing up the DNA to the into the nucleus, that sounds very complicated. Um, well, not really. So let me just give you a couple of minutes on that, just to show you that it's not as complicated as it might sound. So the mitochondrion is this really important part of the cell that performs the chemistry of breathing. It combines oxygen with nutrients in order to extract energy from the nutrients. And it's a really, really complicated machine. The mitochondria have more, well over a thousand uh, different proteins in them. And, um, you know, so, you know, they've got their own DNA and this DNA accumulates damage and it accumulates damage far, far faster than the, than the nuclear DNA that our regular chromosomes have. Um, so, you know, in principle, it would be great to just kind of have backup copies of that mitochondrial DNA. Uh, but then the problem is it's in the wrong place if you put it in the nucleus. So how is it going to actually do its job? And that is potentially a really big problem because proteins have to be in the right place in order to do their job. But the good news is that the mitochondrial DNA does not encode more than a thousand proteins. It only encodes 13 proteins because all of the other genes have already moved during evolution from the mitochondrion to the nucleus. The mitochondrion have existed for a billion years or more. And um, originally it did have a thousand odd genes, but 
um, it's a bad place for DNA to be because mutations accumulate fast. So just over evolution, just accumulation of accidents and selection allowed this to happen. So we've only got these 13 other ones left. And it seems quite manageable to put 13 genes into the nucleus. And furthermore, once we've done so, we have to, as I say, we have to modify these genes so that the protein goes back to the right place. But we understand how to do that more or less because the other thousand genes are already doing it. They already have machinery that uh, allows them to be relocated it back into the nucleus, allows the protein to be relocated. And that machinery has been well understood and characterized for a long time now. So we really just have to hitchhike on the same machinery. Now, of course, if it were really that easy, we'd have done it by now. And there are plenty of technical difficulties, but it's not nearly as complicated as it may have sounded before I explained all that. Thank you all for watching. I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button for new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon.